In all the chapters of the pages of the human drama, the hinge of history is the cross of Christ. Had the story ended there, God's love for humanity would have been fully demonstrated, but his power never known. Then at once, everything dark, everything dead, was explosively scattered when the light of the world rose up in the tomb and the stone rolled away. Throughout the Bible, accounts of resurrection teach us God's unlimited abilities. And throughout the centuries, the hand of God continues to rattle the cages of death and challenge every lie of the enemy. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and those that he has brought back from the dead brings a game-changing revelation that makes us rethink everything. It ain't over. The overturning reversal of the resurrection power is at Open Door Church. Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole planet Earth to Big Time Burleson, Texas, y'all. This is the Open Door Experience. Boom! Outstanding, 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 my friends. Well, welcome, everybody, friends that have gathered from all over the planet, man, to be here tonight, or I should say today, or for friends that are watching us live all over the world on ODX.TV. Man, I call you guys blessed. People watch us on television, listening to us on the radio, I call you blessed. Guys, today I'm going to be getting off into part two of a really cool sermon series called It Ain't Over, and today I'm going to be talking about the story of the glory in the story of the story of Lazarus. Now, last week, I started off telling you guys that the most important thing in life is knowing Jesus Christ and experiencing the power of his resurrection. You know, the whole motto of everything that we do at Open Door is experience real life, right? That personal encounter, that personal experience, it has to be real and it has to be life-giving. Amen experiencing the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what Brother Paul said in Philippians chapter three. He said, he said, I wanna know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I, something I'm challenging you is to ask you, do you want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection? I mean, surely know him. I'm mean, like, what about all the time? Do you just wanna know him sometimes, but you don't wanna know, excuse me, but you don't wanna know him all the time? Like, no, man, I want to know him all the time. And I want to know him more this week than I knew him last week. And I want to know him more next week than I knew him this week. And not only that, but at the same time, in tandem with that, should be a great big part of my experience is experiencing Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Man, these two things are so important. And so we're talking about... We're talking about resurrection stories in the Bible and then I'm eventually going to end up talking about modern day resurrection stories and what that looks like. And then we're going to be also just looking at the word of God concerning the eight different resurrection stories. There's eight different resurrections. There's eight different appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection. And then there are eight new things that the Bible says he will give us. There are eight new things. So... Guys, I want you, if you would, please open up your Bible to the most famous resurrection story outside of Jesus himself, and let's look at John chapter 11, and we're going to look at the story of Lazarus. John chapter 11 and the story of Lazarus. While you're turning there, let me tell you guys that the Bible is full of stories within the stories, also referred to as embedded narratives. What that means is, okay, out of all the stories that are, in, that are within the Word of God, there is a myriad of other stories that you can discover by learning the one story. Embedded narratives is a huge part of living a prophetic lifestyle, of living a, a biblical, of having a worldview that is biblical, of being able to hear God speak, of walking in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ is this. Living your life in such a way is this. Okay, this event just now happened. What is God trying to teach me through this event? Right? One of the things I like to do is, is whenever I pull up to a red light and I look around and I see 444 on the back of that license plate, I see a word that's on the back, I see a bumper sticker here, I see this, I see that, I see this, and I'm behind a Taurus. 
This just happened, by the way. It happened, actually happened this morning. I, I'm, I, I turn to Leanna and I say, if that was a dream, what would that mean? In other words, what is the embedded narrative in every moment that I'm experiencing God? And am I somebody who walks with God? We're, we're about to discover that if you're the friend of God, then you're somebody who walks with God. Right? And if you're gonna if you're gonna walk in Christ, and if you're gonna walk according to the Spirit of God, and if you're gonna live by the Spirit, and if you're gonna walk with God, you're going to be paying attention to how you are connecting the dots of this. Listen, I don't know that God did that, but I know that God spoke to me in that. I know that there's an embedded narrative in the story of how that actually played out. So an embedded narrative is a literary device in which a character within a story becomes the narrator of the second story even though he's in the first story. And that is a part of anything that you watch. I mean, any favorite movie that you have, like, okay, well, I just like old Tombstone. Okay, well, Tombstone's about, you know, whatever you wanna say Tombstone is about. Okay, because you could say it's about 10 million different things because of all the embedded narratives that are within it. You could say it's a movie about friendship. You could say it's a movie about the Old West. You could say it's a movie about the OK Corral. You could say it's a movie about the Earp family. You could say it's a movie about Doc Holliday. You could say it's a movie about the Cowboys. You could say whatever, but within the storyline are so many small storylines. And guys, we need to learn how to appreciate that within the Word of God. Because God intended us to actually dig deeper and go layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, line upon line, precept upon precept. You guys know the rest of all that. And then you start getting off into, once you get out of that, get off into faith to faith, get off into glory to glory from everlasting unto everlasting. And like, wow, I'm paying attention to this and it's causing me to see that. That's why we need to study the word of God. It's not just about memorizing the words, you know, that's the black ink on the white pages. It's about wrapping your head, getting engaged in the word of God causes you to hear God speak through so many other things. The word of God is indeed glorious. So um, the Bible is nested with endless layers of revelation and discovery of Jesus. And these things are called nested stories. So let's look at the account of Lazarus. This is John chapter 11. We're gonna start off at verse one. And it says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And that's why the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. I want to just stop. Whenever I first started looking off into this whole chapter on the account of Brother Lazarus, and when I started looking off into it most recently, about three weeks ago, I just started going over it over and over and over again and looking at how it was written, the perspective of what it was written from. And one of the things is this, when John writes about this, he, one of the ways that John writes is as if you're asking him a question, and then he answers the question. So there was a certain man who was sick. Everybody say who? Well, Lazarus of Bethany. Now now everybody say where? Where? Well, the town that Mary and her sister Martha lived in. And now everybody say who? who? Well, you know, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now everybody go, ah. Yeah, you got it. That's a that's a wild way to write. I I was, look, I'm not going to get very far through this, okay? And there's 45 verses, there's 45 verses in the Lazarus story, and I'm going to, I'm going to continue to unpack this on Wednesday night, encourage you guys to be here on Wednesday night. But if I didn't go through, I mean, it's like, okay, I want to tell you about Lazarus, and not any Lazarus, but the guy who's from Bethany. And you know Bethany, that's where Martha and Mary are from. Like, which Mary? Because there's six Marys in the New Testament. Oh, well, now, of course, we're talking about Mary, the one who anointed the feet of King Jesus. Like, oh, okay, well, dude, she is also the sister of Martha. I didn't know that. Yeah, and dude, they are the sisters of Lazarus. Okay, so we're talking about that Lazarus? Yeah, dude, that Lazarus. And that's why the two sisters sent word to Jesus that the person that they loved was sick. It's like, you start to see a little bit of the personality of John, don't you? John's a trip. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, you, you start to see what John was like. Yeah, I, I, yeah, he's just so into it. All right. So they sent word to him and they said this word. And then 
uh, verse, where are we at? Verse three, therefore the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, when Jesus heard that, verse four, he said, well, this sickness is not in a death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. That didn't happen. Jesus said the cat's not gonna die, and if he does die, it ain't gonna be from the sickness. And then he sits down, and two days later, they get word he died. Most disciples will not be able to follow King Jesus after that. People get so offended over some stupid thing that they don't like. And Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that because we have to understand that because that's a problem. Are you guys willing to go there? Can you be challenged? Or does Jesus have to do everything in a way that you could figure out? Because if, you, if you're the kind of guy, well, that stumps me and I'm gonna be mad for two and a half years now and I'm gonna twist off and I'm gonna have pastor issues. Wah, wah, wah. Let me call you a ambulance. <laughs> this is a tough day and you're following a tough Jesus and you gotta get with a tough program. <laughs> Amen. Because I'm telling you right now, this scripture does say that Jesus, the response that Jesus said, oh, there's no problem. This sickness ain't gonna kill him. But I can tell you what is gonna happen. God Almighty is gonna be glorified. And furthermore, the Son of God is gonna be glorified. Well, what the, what in the, what? Because the rest of the story is, oh, and the sickness was unto death. Like, what, what do you do with that? Well, first of all, let me tell you, we're dealing with translations and I don't, there's going to be people who go, oh, he's just going to blame that on translation. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you another way that you could say this. Are you ready? It's this. This sickness is not about his death. It's about the glory of God. That's another way that you could say that. Thank you, Pastor Jerry Sellers. Right? Jerry came. Me, me and Jerry were talking about this earlier. And he says, it's, it's not about that. It's actually about this. But let's just, let's just forget about that for, for a minute. And what if the exact way what if this is translated exactly correctly? Which, who knows if it is. I mean, you, you'd have to look up every single word and know every single jot and tittle to know exactly the flow and the phrase of how he said. But let's just, let's just say that this is exactly what he said. And he said, this sickness is not unto death. But I, can, but I can tell you what is gonna happen. God's gonna be glorified and the son of God is gonna be glorified. Here's what I wanna tell you is this. You're gonna to have to learn how to walk with God in such a way that God Almighty can tell you something and that if it doesn't happen, you go, well, that didn't happen, but I can still trust the Lord. You're like, whoa, then that means that God lies. No, 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 that does not mean. Listen, God is not a liar. I promise you. Well, but if God says it, then it has to happen. And if God wants it to happen, it has to happen. That is religion and it is baloney. Here's what I'm going to tell you is this. God Almighty knows every single scenario possible. Okay, you have to know that God Almighty can speak in terms of scenarios. A good example, but, but that doesn't mean that he, is for, that he is foreordained that particular scenario. Can I go a little bit deeper with this? Is this all right? Okay, so here's King David in the Old Testament. King David's being chased by Saul, and he says, God, I gotta ask you something. He says, shoot. And he says, okay, is Saul gonna catch me, and is Saul gonna, is, is Saul gonna get me? And he said, yeah, he is. And he goes, okay, that's not good news. I was hoping you'd say something different, God. And he said, okay, I'm hiding in this town, and whenever, whenever Saul shows up here, are these, my friends, going to turn me over to them? And he's like, yeah, they will. Now, they kind of owed him. His friends did. But it's going to be classic siege warfare. They're going to surround a place. They're going to starve everybody out. And he's like, yeah. After, as soon as they get hungry and they get scared, I'm telling you, they're going to throw you out. So what did God say? God said, first of all, he said, yeah, Saul's gonna get you and it ain't good. Number two, these folks are gonna turn you over to him. Then you know what the next verse says? And it says, and David went out the back door and none of it happened. Yeah. It's exactly in the Bible. <laughs> so God is speaking many times when God Almighty is declaring something, he's speaking in terms of a scenario. And you need to know and you need to understand that. But God Almighty tells Brother Jonah, go up there and prophesy and tell him, hey man, 40 days they're all gonna die. And man, he was so happy to get up and preach that word because he hated the Ninevites. Hated their guts. And he said, I'm gonna sit right up here and I'm not leaving till I watch 
y'all smoke. And then they repented. And then God didn't do it. And then Jonah got so mad at God, he said, did I tell you that was going to happen? Didn't I tell you that if I told them 40 days, they would have time to repent, they would repent, and then you wouldn't wipe them out? You've turned me into a false prophet. I should have just gave them four minutes. It's a crazy way to think. So did God, so did God lie? No, he was talking about the way a scenario was going, but many times things change. You're like, well, it can't. It has to be solid. That's because you think that God is, is a blind, you think, you think he's just the, the blind mechanics of fate, and he's not. He is so relational. So here's what I'm going to tell you is this, okay? Don't think so much of yourself that you think that you hear every single time that God speaks to you. And don't think so much of yourself that you think that you understand God every time you know that you've heard God speak. And do not think so much of yourself that you think you know exactly what to do when you do know that you understood what God was speaking to you when he spoke to you. And do not think that you know what the outcome is going to be because you know what to do when you heard God speak. And do not think that you know for certain it will happen when you know what the outcome is going to be. And just say, I belong to Jesus and I surrender. Are y'all tracking with me on that? They're like, okay, well then, well then I can't know anything. No, that is baloney. You can know so many things and you can know Jesus. But if Jesus changes in the midst of his course, you have to say, well, he is God. Amen. You just say, well, you know, he is God and I'm not. And so I guess I just have to just deal with the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Because he will change. And he'll change some things. Well, it was going this way, and I know I told you it was going that way, but I got great news. It's going to go a completely different way. Do you know sometimes God Almighty will tell you to do something, and then you step up into it, you labor, you pray, you fast. You're like, okay, okay, God, I'm going to do it. And you lay it all down, and you step in, and he goes, switch! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? I told you I didn't even want to do this thing and then you made me do it and I finally did it. He's like, I just want to bring you into a place where you'd finally do it. Now I can change things and now we can move on. Like you don't got it all figured out. Just, just follow King Jesus. And I want to just tell you this, it's like that in the midst of any romance. Like what? That ain't what I thought you said. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. And it's like, you didn't hear what I said. I heard exactly what you said. What did I say? And I tell her, she said, that has nothing to do with what I said. Or Leanna will tell me, I told you that. And I go, you didn't tell me that. Oh, you did not tell me that. And she said, I plainly told you, but you were not paying any attention to me. I'm like, well, maybe you did tell me that. I just don't. Okay, in the midst of any relationship, there's going to be confusing issues. And this, your salvation, is based upon a relationship. And I promise you, you're going to have days where, okay, I'm reassured because I know that I know that God told me this thing and everything's good. And then two days later, everything changes and you go, okay, I don't understand anything that's going on. That is a part of any relationship. And guys, you can't divorce. You can't just walk out from God and go, right, you know what, I trusted you. Actually, many times when we say, I trusted you and it didn't work was this. I trusted my understanding in the midst of our relationship and I do not have it anymore. Well, sometimes you're gonna have to check your dignity at the door in order to grab a hold of the deity of King Jesus. I was like, man, I wish I had it all figured out. I wish, listen, I try so hard to look cool and I can't like, I, I try hard to look cool. And I can't look cool. I, I've been trying to look cool my whole life, and I can't never look cool. And I say, Lord, can you please put me in a situation where I look cool, please? <laughs> and he'll tell me, yeah, right here, son, step right here. I'm like, ah, and it don't, I don't look cool. I'm like, Lord, I trusted you with that. I wanted to look cool in that. And he's like, Troy, this sickness is not unto death, <laughs> but that the Lord would be glorified. The more I think about this verse, the more I love this verse. There's just a, a, there's like a whole galaxy of mysteries in this verse. 
And I'm looking at different languages. I'm just, I'm thinking, man, at first I'm just insistent on that's not translated right. Then I'm like, no, it is translated right. I'm not sure, I'm still not sure it is translated right. But, but let's just say it is exactly what it says. Can you still walk with God when you know you heard God speak and the scenario changes? Because you better be able to. You got to walk with that. I want to just ask you this. You can have the most stable spouse on the whole planet Earth and one day they just pull out the card. I reserve the right to lose my mind today and you better love me through it. <laughs> Not that I know from experience. <laughs> but I've read it on the internet. I want to tell you right now, Leanna is so smart about how she loses her mind. Now, I'm a knucklehead. I'm never smart in how I lose my mind, okay, because I'm a boy. But she's so smart. She will literally say, she will literally tell me, I'm like, baby, is everything okay? No, everything's not good. And I'm a girl, and I'm going to be a girl all day. Deal with it. I'm like, girl alert. Let me call up of my friends. Y'all don't come over. Leanna's having a girl day over here, and I'm just going to have to deal with it. Like, yeah, you had better be willing to deal with that. And if you're not, then go crawl in bed with some hairy-legged man, because I'm a girl. Hallelujah. Boy, I got y'all's attention, didn't you? Like, where's that going? Like, where, what are you doing with that, Pastor Troy? I'm not saying I'm willing. We so cannot put this on television. <laughs> Y'all totally mess up my really cool sermon. Well, then verse five, it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so it just says one more time, I want you to pay attention in the first five verses. It says, man, he loved him, man, he loved him, man, he loved him, man, he loved him, man, he loved him. And this is John, are you ready? Whom the Lord loved. I don't know that there wasn't some kind of weird thing going on with John. You know, I'm always talking about how much he loves him. I thought you always talked about how much he loved me. Every time we talk about Lazarus and Mary, and Mary he sure does love them. But I'm the, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. I know he loves me. And I'm going to write that down in my book. I'm not even going to call myself John. I'm going to call myself the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's what I'm going to do. But, but right here... He's like, my God, how he always loved me. And he loved him, and he loved him, and he loved him. Like, why would he do that? I think because Jesus was always telling the disciples how much he loved them. I mean, you just say, man, isn't Lazarus funny? Isn't he cool? Just don't you love Lazarus? I love Lazarus. I was like, mm-hmm. No, really. Really, have, I love his laugh. I like the way he laughs. It ain't funny just how he laughs. I love how he takes care of his sisters. I, as much as he tries, it's really, though, his sisters who have to constantly take care of him. And I, I just love Lazarus. I just love him. So John is just like, I, I'm going to tell everybody, listen, he really loved Lazarus. Can, I, can we just talk about Lazarus for just a second? I still got 20 minutes. Is that all right? And I am four verses into this. Hallelujah. We only have 40 more to go. <laughs> so I want to just ask you, okay, so they had the funeral. Why do you think the funeral went that day? When they had the funeral, when they told Jesus, hey, come here quickly, man. This guy that you love with all your heart, he's about to die. He said, don't worry, he ain't going to die. And then, of course, he did die. Why do you think that funeral went? Well, dearly beloved, we had gathered here today in the presence of King Jesus. Oh, who's not here? <laughs> Could have been. Well, he had something to do, watching old episodes of MASH, I would imagine. <laughs> Who knows where he's at. But he really did love, oh, how he loved him, until he got sick and he didn't show up. That's kind of unfortunate. But what can we say of the character of Christ? Well, not much right now, because apparently he lies, and he doesn't show up when his friends show up. I bet that funeral was a downer. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, okay? What do y'all think his second funeral was like? Y'all ever thought about the second funeral of Lazarus? I just felt the Lord. Because you know Lazarus had two funerals, right? Because he died once, and then he lived for a while, then the brother killed over again. Okay, so I, I think, when I think about this, I just say, man, I would love to have preached that second funeral. It's like, well, friends, we're all here once again. Good to see y'all again. I haven't seen y'all since the last time Lazarus died. 
<laughs> Man, I hadn't seen so and so. I said, well, the last time Lazarus died. Man, it's good to see you again, brother. Like, man, don't you know that that was a trip? And isn't it funny? Again, I think that there's something weird that's going on between John and Lazarus. I, I honestly do. I think that there's something weird that goes on between them. Because Jesus tells Peter, he says, if I want this cat to live forever, he will. And then he, John writes it down at the end of the book of John. And some people are saying that I'm going to live forever. Now you put that in light of John chapter 11. Oh, how he loved Lazarus. And then at the end of the book of John, he says, but Jesus didn't say I was going to live forever. He just said, what if I want him to live forever? Oh, and I am the disciple whom Jesus loved, the end. <laughs> that, read it for yourself. I know this is weird commentary, and I know, you know, I know you're not going to hear this anywhere else, but I'm all about the stories within the stories within the stories within the stories. And I just see a lot of humanity here, and I just see God laughing his head off. Because, because it was said that Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. And then he died. And then at the end of the book of John, he says, it is said that Jesus said that I will never die. But he didn't actually say that. He just said, what if I don't, what is it to you if I don't ever want him to die? What do you care? You mind your own business. And to prove the point that John gets on people's nerves, he had provoked Peter to the point to where, God, to where Peter said, please tell me about his death. <laughs> what about him? When's he going to die? I want to hear that story. That's, guys, it's all in the Bible, I'm telling you. So what do you have here? You got all these messages. You got all this stuff going on. And then one of the narratives that I see in this that is incredible is friendship and covenant relationships that has to do with this. Jesus had then and still has today friends he is closer to than others. And it's like, whoa, what? Now, wait a minute. Jesus loves everybody the same. Okay, well, he loves everybody the same in the sense of he's totally committed to everybody the same. He's willing to lay down his life for anybody. But don't you think for one second that there are some people compatible with him and some people he's not compatible with? Because that's really what friendship comes down to is who can you be compatible with? Fellowship and friendship have to do with compatibility. And so what is compatibility? Well, it's a state in which two things are able to exist or occur together without conflict. Wow, without conflict. That's interesting. So compatibility is this. Okay, can we be around each other without pulling each other's hair out? Can we be around each other without, you know, costly insulting each other? That's why I can't be around Trey right there. That's why nobody likes him. Trey has no friends whatsoever. Sad. Guys, everybody stretch your hands towards Trey Smoker. Can we do that? God, give him friends. <laughs> Actually, Trey is a really good friend to people, and he's a very, very, very good friend to me. And we're, we're incredibly compatible. And we just love each other. We're both from Joshua. He's a whole lot older than me. But, <laughs> but you know, if I'm going to be the friend of Jesus, I have to, there's one thing for him to be committed to me. But there's another thing for me to live a life that is compatible with his friendship. It's completely different. And a lot of people do not consider this. They just think that God is going to show up however, whenever, and he very well might. But I want to just tell you, I don't call people that I think, man, that's going to be a butt kicking the whole time I'm talking to that person. We're allowed to say that in church, right? I'm sorry that kind of came out. I think, oh my God, that's going to do, oh, here we go. Listen, here we go. I got to call so-and-so. Every time I call them, all they want to do is gripe and complain and whatever. I do not call those people. I send those people nice notes. Am I committed to communicating I love them? Yes, I am. Am I their friend? Mm -mm. I can't be around in five minutes. Like, Pastor Troy, you're a pastor. You can't say this. Do not think for one second that there ain't people I like and people I don't like. And if you expect me to be anything different, then you're nuts, right? Like, well, well, well do you like me? Probably not. <laughs> I 
honestly, I really get along with such a diverse group of people. And I'm, I'm really shocked when I cannot get along with somebody. And like, it always really offends me if I can't get along with somebody. I mean, I'm sorry, but it just does. I was telling everybody at the prison the other night, and this is so true, like I fully expect me to be able to get along with everybody. I fully do. And I fully expect that to be reciprocal. And when it's not, man, it makes me mad. And that has just been a great immaturity upon my own behalf. And just like, man, I just was convinced everybody in the world would love me. And what's real is, some people are stupid. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Like, what are you gonna do with that? Like, you can't fix stupid, right? Now look, I'm obviously just being a little bit silly, but I'm also being very real, and it's this, just because I have chosen to love everybody, and just because I've chosen to travel the world, and just because I've chosen to say, no, I wanna live a life that is demonstrated of King Jesus, does not mean that there are some people I'm a whole lot more compatible with than others. Amen. And just exactly like that, Jesus has some friends that he's a whole lot closer to than other people. And if you are not close friends with King Jesus, it's on you. It's, it's not on him because he has given you a green light. He has given you a permission. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many people are invited, but few people show up. That's what that verse means. And he's like, I have, listen, I want to be the friend of everybody. Jesus even calls, Jesus is called the friend of sinners. But that doesn't mean that they are his friends. He's been their friend, but they may not have been his friend. Proverbs chapter 18, verse one says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and he rages against all wise judgment. Oh. See, God Almighty wants to restore friendship. And you know, one of the things that I see lacking within the body of King Jesus is friendship. And the reason why there is, and, 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 and I wanna stop and tell you this, I ain't doing that. If I can't be friends with my staff, I fire them. I, I have literally fired people not based upon their ability to, um, to do a job, but their ability to be my friend. Like, you, you're crazy. You can't do that. I don't even think that's legal. If it ain't reciprocal, there are seven billion people on this planet, and I will find somebody who thinks it's cool to hang around me. I am not gonna be around a bunch of miserable people that don't wanna work in a church, that don't wanna be around other people, that you know what, they don't put up with each other, they tattletale on each other. Boy, you don't, you don't tattletale to me on somebody else. I don't like that. You don't betray your friendship. You don't tell other people's secrets to me. Man, you don't do that. Like, no, we're gonna be friends and we're gonna love each other. Do you hear me? We're gonna love each other! It's a church! Church is full of folk that hate each other and ain't got no friends whatsoever. No friends. <laughs> Those people find themselves metal detecting. <laughs> I got no friends. <laughs> I got no friends. I'm sorry, but I have a metal detector. I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> making fun of my fellow metal detector people. <laughs> He used to make fun of my dad all the time because he loved Bill. I was like, Dad, you know what that's saying every time? I have no friends. Mm -hmm. I have no friends. Well, Jesus wants us to be friends. And guys, this is a year of covenant relationships. Do you guys remember 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 23 says, may it be between the Lord, may it be between you and me and the Lord forever. May the Lord be between you and me forever. And that's a 2023 scripture. So I, I want to tell you, if you need a revelation in friendship, and if you're like, okay, look, I want to be, I, I truly want to be the friend of God. I do. That's awesome. Now here's what I want to tell you. Live a life that is compatible with him, where he feels welcome. You know, if, 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 if you have a bunch of kids, like, okay, so we have, we have a guest house out at Third Stage Ranch, and there is somebody in that house all the time all the time. People come from all over the world to stay there. And it's a sacred space. It's a space where dreams and visions happen. And people come like, I'm so excited about spending the night here. I think I'm going to have a dream. So I bet you do. I bet you do. And so people come there and uh, all my friends from all over the world. And here's the deal. If you've got kids and if you're bringing your little kids, I'm going to have that house full of toys. And I'm going to have all kinds of brand spanking new toys in there for your kids to take home. 
if you come and if you don't have kids, I'm not going to have toys in there. Unless Trey comes over. <laughs> I'll have his special blocks lined out for him because I'm Trey's friend. So like, what do you, what do you like, okay, if you, let me just, let me just tell you this. If you're from a certain part, okay, last week I had uh, Pastor Alan DiDio and his beautiful family were there. Just love them. Okay, the week before that, I had Stephen Gashumba was in the house. Just love him. And the week before that, I, 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 could, I could keep on and on. The bottom line is, we fix the house up different for everybody that is there. Like, why? Because I want to accommodate them, and I want to have details in my friendship towards them, and I don't want anything that looks like, then that ain't, that ain't for me. Do you know that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? And here's one of the ways that I've learned to tell my kids and to tell my grandkids, because I learned this from the Lord, I heard, I asked God, God, what does it mean when I grieve you? And, and God, I heard this phrase, that's not for me. I went, that's not for me. And I was like, I need to write that down. That's not for me. That's not for me. I got to think about it. I'll be a part of something and I'll be walking with God. And all of a sudden I can literally feel the displeasure of the Lord. Anybody in here ever felt the displeasure of the Lord? You say something, and as soon as you say it, you go, oh, God wasn't happy with that. And it's not, it's not about walking in, in a whole bunch of rules. It's about, man, I want to live a life that is compatible with my friendship with King Jesus. And say, uh, Holy Ghost, everything okay? No, it's, I'm out. That's not for me. Like, whoa. And that's a good way to understand. So, it's something I tell my grandkids all the time. Hey, man, that's not for you. We're not, we're not looking at that. We're not listening to that trash. That's not how we live our life. That ain't for us. I can, I can feel, you can literally grieve the Holy Spirit by how compatible or actually how incompatible the lifestyle that you're living is with him. So God Almighty sees you and that's really good, but it's better if he visits you. That's really good, but it's better if he habitates you. So you can go from God sees me to God visits me to God habitates with me. And you know what's going to have to happen in order for God to habitate with you? You're going to have to conform your life to him. If he don't show up with a bunch of babies, you don't have a bunch of diapers in his room. That's it. Like, why would you do that? You're serving somebody else while I'm staying with you. Do you understand the language I'm speaking? So I love this kind of language, and I, I, and I love this kind of stuff. The Apostle John refers to fellow believers in churches as his friends. It's like, no, man, we're going to be friends, and this is not going to be about, uh, you know, contract. It's going to be about covenant. We're going to love each other, and we're going to put up with each other. I told, I told Pastor Jerry and him and his beautiful bride are in here. I told Pastor Jerry when I hired him, I said, Jerry, I'm hiring you, man, to be my XO, and I'm hiring you here to do this job, this job, this job, this job, this job. And he said, okay, boss, I'm telling you we can do that. I said, but know this, I can hire a lot of other people to do that. I'm hiring you to live life with me. And we're gonna have to help each other. And I don't care, listen, I'm, I'm just telling you right now, we have to love each other, and we have to help each other, and we're gonna help each other to be greater and greater and greater men of God, and I just wanna be your friend. And I flat out told him, if you're not going to be my friend, you need to go back to the last job that you just got. Because ministry is too hard. I want to have covenant friendships within, within my life. And it doesn't mean it's always easy. But I want to just tell you this, man. I don't know very many people in the world that can say, hey, man, you see my staff? Those are all my really, really good friends. That's a big deal, isn't it? You know where I learned that from? Jesus. Jesus insisted on having close friends with him in ministry. And I think that if Jesus Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he's, a, he's the alpha of all things, right? If he needs friends, then probably stupid old Troy Brewer needs friends. And if you hadn't been thinking like that, maybe you should think like that. So I want to ask you the question, are you the friend of Jesus? He said, man, I am. I am the friend of Jesus. Okay, here's what Jesus says in John chapter 15. He says this. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And whenever I first saw that, I went, eh, that ain't, I don't like that. Like, why? Because that ain't friendship, that's servitude. And I know what servitude is because friendship is the upgrade of servitude. So I'm just like, Lord, Lord, I have a problem with this. You need to be real about the scriptures that you have problems with. I am not afraid of the scriptures that I have problems with. And I got a bunch of, I have a bunch of scriptures I have problems with. And I actually enjoy it. Like, wh stop. What do you mean you enjoy it? Man, it's like, okay, I have learned 
that Leanna is going to paint my house like a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> I've learned that. I've been married to her for 34 years. And I'm, I'll tell you, you go in any room in my house, the walls are different colors. Who does that? Leanna does that. And I have learned, I think I need to learn to appreciate and enjoy this thing that I do not get about Leanna. And I just need to think it's cool and I need to think it's awesome. And now when I go over to anybody's house, I'm privately judging them because they only have one color inside their house. <laughs> like every other sane person does. And I'm like, dude, these folks are no fun. They just got one color inside their house. You get in the car, we'll talk bad about you. Leanna, did you see that house? They only had one color. She's like, that's right, baby. You know, she just knows she's trained me. You need to learn to appreciate that I want lots of colors inside my house. Just exactly like that. When I come across stuff that I don't understand, I don't run away from it and go, oh, oh that just shakes my faith. I go, oh, I got something to bring before the Lord. And I say, Lord, do you want to talk to me about this? Like what? This problem. And I, guys, I study the Bible, so I have lots of issues that I come across going, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know how that works at all. And many times, you know what God will say? When I come before him and say, King Jesus, I need to talk to you about this because I have a problem with it. Can, can we talk? And he'll go, no, I'm good. I'll be like, stop. No, no, no. I have a problem with this. Oh, are you okay? <laughs> Troy, are you going to be all right, man? No, it's okay, man. I, we can just halt everything right here. I'll park out with you right here, man. We can just learn to love each other in the midst of our terrible offense for each other. Or you can move on because I'm not talking to you about this. I am, I'm amazed when God doesn't talk to me about something. And I have learned to mark, man, God ain't talking to me about that. Like I'm really searching this out and I got nothing. I'm seeking this out. I got nothing. I'm asking God, I got nothing. And many times God's like, because I ain't there with you in that. But you talk to so-and-so about it. Yeah, because they need me to talk to them about it. But you don't. I know exactly what your gig is, and that has nothing to do with who I've called you to be. Move along. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Because I'm telling you. I'm telling you. That's why, that's why you don't need to look at everybody else's walk and try and walk what everybody else is walking in. You walk in what God has for you to walk in. Mm. So I got to look at this, and he did talk to me about this because I began to look it up. I began to look up all the different versions of this. I began to look up the Greek. I began to look up all this stuff in John 15. I said, Lord, what is this? And the Amplified Version puts this verse this way. You are my friends if you keep on doing what I command you to do. When he says, you're my friend if you do what I command you is a present future tense word. It's like, what? Okay, here's the deal. When you're in servitude, when you're in the servant level, it's like, well, I'm, I've never been there. Oh, well, you better get there. Yeah, I mean, you better get to that servant place. And I know you're an American, and I know that you got your act together better than anybody else does. I, I totally get it. But I promise you, if you don't learn service to the Lord, you're not going to learn Jesus. And so, man, you're just like, okay, here's the deal. When you're in that servant mode, <laughs> you're going to be in this place that nobody else wants to be and you're going to be willing to sit in the place that nobody else wants to sit and you're just going to be there because that's all that you know to do to be with my program and here's what I'm going to do I'm going to come to you in that place and I'm going to promote you and here's what the promotion is going to look like I'm going to move you, I'm going to move you now from servanthood into friendship and here's the difference he explained to the disciples is see the reason why it's important for me to no longer call you servants but now to call you friends is because I'm now ready to start sharing all my plans with you and the master does not do that with his servants so I'm going to start letting you in on the big game guys and this is going to be good and here's what he says this if you're going to be my friend and move into that friend category don't you stop doing what I commanded you to do you don't you don't dismiss the servant part you just it's just a given that you've got that down and you're going to continue to do that because you are now the friend of God but then the day comes and he changes your life from being a friend and he invites you into sonship. Now look, you're already the child of God, but that doesn't mean that you're walking in the promises of the inheritance of his goodness. Man, I, I love being called a child of God. It's one thing to be called, it's one thing to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We all wanna hear that, right? But I wanna tell you, that's not the highest thing that you can hear. Here's something better. 
this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Like, well, you ain't the son of God. Oh, I am. You are too. And Jesus Christ has made me that. And you know what? The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for these are the sons of God. The Bible says, come on, you know the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit, he gives them power to be called sons of God. Like, that's just blasphemy. It's not blasphemy to walk in a thing that Jesus died for me to walk in. Amen. And let me tell you what it means to be a son of God. It doesn't mean that you are divine. It means that you get the full inheritance. And that's the difference between friends and sons. And that's why you got to have an upgrade from friendship into sonship because friends do not inherit anything. Sons inherit everything. Amen. My goodness how the Lord has an inheritance for you. I'm talking about good things. The goodness of God is for you. Amen. You are indeed called sons of God. And that's not a gender biased uh, statement. The reason why it says sons and not just sons and daughters, which it does sometimes, but in the day that the Bible was written, it was sons who received the full inheritance. So you and I get to receive the full inheritance of the glory of God. Finally, guys, the last thing that I want to throw at you is this. You guys remember whenever Jesus said, no, I don't think his sickness is going to kill me. He said, actually, he said, this sickness is not about his death. It's about the glory of God. And it is also particularly that the son of God would be glorified. Guys, I want to just talk to you about the glory of God. And, and, and I want to finish up. And again, I'll finish. I'll go into this a whole lot deeper on Wednesday night. But friends, I got to end by talking about the glory of God. Because he said, well, this thing is not going to be about how horrible his death is. But it's going to be about how good God is. And this is going to glorify the Lord, to glorify God. Mm. What, is, what is the glory of God? Well, the glory of God is very hard to define. And there's so many scriptures that is on the glory of God, so many, but they're really not distinctly definitive. Like, okay, well, let me ask you this. Let me stop. It's like, well, how come? Well, okay, Jesus is the express image of the glory of God. Okay, what does Jesus look like? Um, nobody knows. There's not a single description of what Jesus looks like in the Bible. Isn't that crazy? Have almost 32,000 verses in a book about somebody and not tell us what it is that he looks like? And the Lord hadeth long hair and stood us six foot three incheth having bronze skin, brown eyes, and jet blacketh hair as the manner of most Jews haveth. Doesn't say that. Like, so what does Jesus look like? That's what the glory of the Lord is. When something looks more like heaven than it looks like hell, that's the glory of God. <laughs> When, when God can be understood, when God can be felt, when God Almighty, when God can be known, that is also the glory of God. I was looking this week and asking people about the glory of God. It's his manifest goodness. Do you guys remember whenever, whenever Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. I got to see your glory. He says, okay, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you and I will proclaim my name to you. So what is it? It's what God does and who God is that's so holy and so different from everything else. All those things fall into the category of the glory of God. So he said, look, this is what's gonna happen. Listen, this is really not about how this death is gonna kill him. This is really about how God can be known and specifically how the Son of God can be known. And then you go off into the rest of the resurrection story, and then that is exactly what happens. Friends, I, I want to tell you this. Sometimes you can just be overwhelmed with God's goodness, and if you haven't been in a long time, it's time for you to be. If, if you've got God all figured out, and you're an old stick in the mud, I want to encourage you. And tell you this, go out to God and say, God, I don't want to get through my day without being able to throw my head back and laugh at how awesome you are. I, I, need, I need to see that. Well, I wish I'd see a miracle that happened like you saw the other night, Pastor Troy. Well, I wish you'd get up and go do something. Because there's miracles everywhere around you. Well, I've been living my whole life and I don't ever see no miracles. Because you can't find them watching WWE. Or out squatch hunting. 
You're going to have to get with the Jesus program is what you're going to have to do. And you're going to have to be a seeker. And if you'll be a seeker, you'll be a finder. I'm always looking for, for, for the goodness of God to show up because I'm always willing to point it out. I'm somebody who lives my life ready to acknowledge the goodness of God and be able to say, now the kingdom of heaven looks just like that. Like, man, that's awesome. That is awesome. Woo! I got a bunch of predetermined responses to God's goodness like I have a bunch of predetermined responses to Leanna. Because I'm a knucklehead boy and if I do not make myself do certain certain things, I will never do that. You know, I, I told my daughters how pretty they were today without telling Leanna how pretty she was first. And I want to tell you, my daughters caught it. Did you tell her that? Well, yes, I have many times. She turned around and looked at me and went, I'm like, <laughs> Leanna, in my mind, I have thought about how beautiful you are all day long. I'm telling you, I woke up thinking about it. I'm thinking about it right now, and I think about it so much, I think I've already told you 10,000 times how beautiful you are. Now, I'm doing this not so much because me and Leanna have to do that, but my sons are listening, and I'm trying to train those knuckleheads. Boy, you better learn how to crawfish out of things, and you better learn predetermined responses. And I told her, I said, you know why I didn't do that? I said, why? I said, because you didn't do it. She said, that's right. I, I wore a different outfit today. And I said, well, you know why? I didn't realize it was a new outfit. Number one, because I didn't buy it for you, and I'm, I, I love to buy our clothes. But number two, you didn't do the twirl. I've, we do the twirl. When you put on something new, you come in and you do the twirl, and I stop what I'm doing and go, ooh! That's what I do. And then everything's good for the rest of the day. And she's like, Troy, these are pants, and I can't do a twirl in the pants. I'm like, okay, help me then, and go in and go, I can't do the twirl, but I need to hear it. And I promise you, I will stop what I'm doing and overstate the obvious like all women need to hear over and over and over again. Hey Amen. No, listen. No, there's some girls. Y'all been trained to be so offended at men. No, if you don't know that you need to have the obvious overstated to you, uh, then you don't understand your own self. Guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, ladies, y'all just, y'all just don't listen. I'm gonna talk to the guys. Okay, men, hear me say this to you: If she fixes you supper and you scrape the plate until you crack glass, you make so much noise like Jerry Sellers eating. <laughs> Right? Okay. And then if you lick the plate, and then if you lick the pan, but if you do not say you liked it, she will not believe it. It's not because she's stupid. It's because the least you can do is tell her and acknowledge the fact that she stayed up cooking for you. Because she wasn't doing that to make a really good meal. She was doing that so that you would say, I recognize you made a really good meal. And just do it. That's all you got to do. And like, well, that's kind of demeaning to women. Oh, okay. Well, it is not demeaning to women. You know what? There's nothing wrong with a man telling a woman how beautiful she is, how awesome she is, and how much she, how much she is appreciated. Amen. And so just overstate the obvious. I, I, say, I say the most ridiculous things in the whole world. I'll say like, I notice you're wearing earrings. I'm making a stab at it because I'm a stupid boy and I don't know what to say. And she'll say, oh really? Yeah, do you like these? I love that. I, it makes your earlobe glisten in the sun as it goes back and forth. <laughs> I woke up this morning thinking, God, I hope I see watermelon earrings in Leanna's ear today. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly how we talk back and forth to each other. And she'll be like, keep it coming, boy. You're, you're close. You're not far. I'm like, how am I doing? I'm getting there. She goes, no, you're not there yet. Keep going. That's beautiful and that's wonderful. Now I've said all that to say this. When it comes to the glory of the Lord, there's going to be things between you and God, that God is going to show up and you're going to recognize his glory and you're going to know God in a way and you're going to try and share it with everybody else and they're going to be nothing but critical and just think you're stupid. Right? 
I mean, they're just going to go, I mean, you're going to hear God speak and you're going you're gonna to go and tell them, dude, you're not going to believe what happened. It was so crazy. It was so awesome. It was so, and they're like, well, okay, I need you to explain that. You can't explain it. You don't know. Like all you can say is, man, God really moved. Man, I felt the Lord or man, something crazy happened. And, and again, I, I saw something like that happen the other night and it was so good with this guy getting his Bible, his daddy's Bible in this prison situation, right? But I'm gonna tell you, there've been other times too, the glory of God showed up. I cannot define one thing. I don't know why we all fell on the floor. I don't know why we were overwhelmed. I don't know why everybody bawled and squalled for five or six hours. I don't know why people's lives were changed. I don't know why. It was just the glory. It was just the tangible presence of the Lord. Sometimes you can just see it in how other people live their lives. And sometimes you can just, you know, the Bible says that the Queen of Sheba in 1 Kings 10, that when she saw the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on the table, the seating of the servants, the servants of his waiters, their apparel, uh, his cupbearers, and the entryway by which they went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. I mean, she fainted. She just, just Solomon's decorations caused her to say, there is a God in heaven and his name is Yahweh. And I had no idea. I had no, now this is a woman who was familiar with royalty. She was royalty. And she's like, I've seen royalty all over the world. I know, I know what royalty looks like, but this, I've never seen anything like this. This does not come from Israel. This comes from God. Your God is God. Like, wh why? Because she knew that stuff and she knew that that was not worldly wisdom. It was heavenly apparel. It was, it was, it, it came from God. And she's like, whoa, 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 I got, and look, she literally just went, and just fell over. Like, well, why? Ain't she never seen nice clothes before? Like what? No, it's the glory of the Lord. It's the glory of God. Friends, I want to just tell you that you and I are supposed to cause people to see the glory of God or to make people aware of his goodness by how we live our lives. Matthew chapter five, verse 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Remember the glory of the Lord and when people glorify God is when they come to know him and when they come to understand him and when they come to believe he is, he is obtainable, when God becomes tangible and real in their lives. And you can live your life in such a way that people just go, that's totally Jesus. Recently, Leanna and I was, was in a restaurant and I was watching, I always pay attention to our waiters and waitresses. I, I, do, I do strange things like this. If some girl walks up and says, hello, my name's Christy and I'm gonna be your servitor. I stop and say, well, hell, stop. Before she keeps talking, like what? Well, my name's Troy and this is Leanna. Well, in what other situation do people introduce themselves and they don't expect you to introduce yourself back? Like, why would you, I'm not just going to sit there and, okay, well, I know your name, but I'm not going to tell you mine. Well, that's not going to do it. And if she doesn't want to know who I am, well, then don't tell me who you are. <laughs> no, listen, I'm adamant about this stuff. <laughs> Poor Leanna. And so I tell well, hey, I'm Troy, and this is my bride, Leanna. Hey, how are you? We shake hands, and I'm like, okay. She's like, well, tonight's special is yada, 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 yada. So I'm paying attention during that time, because out of all the people in the world that could have came to my table, this girl is at my table. And I'm just going to be there for just a few minutes. Is there some way that that girl can see the Father's heart towards me? Towards her, I should say. Is there, is there, is there some way that... That is there some way that her day can be better because we're there and she attributes that to the Lord, which is she begins to glorify God because of it. Is there something that I can do in this small moment, in this window, I have a small opportunity where I just want for things to be a little bit more like heaven than they are like hell. And that's where the glory of the Lord shows up. That comes from living a life that's in pursuit of his glory, that loves his presence that is after him in every single way, that is madly in love with him. And I, 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 guys, I'm so real when I'm up here talking to you cats and I'm just, I just wanna be so real and I can tell you what's real. This is what's real. I love Jesus and I'm after him. I'm not trying to fix you. I'm not trying to any of that kind of stuff. But I do want you to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. I do want you to know that. 
And I want to know that. And I think, I think the promise of the Lord is, is that before he comes back, more and more and more, you and I are going to have the glory of God revealed. And the more glory of God that, that is revealed to you and I, the more and more and more we can walk in things that cause other people to see his glory. Guys, let's give King Jesus a great big praise. Come on. Awesome.